I stared at four olives. I hate olives. They sat there, swimming in their juices in a metallic package. The only solid food I was supposed to have that day after nothing more than herbal tea and tomato soup. I popped one in quick and it squeaked as my teeth slid into its flesh, discharging a vegetal liquid that coated my tongue. I looked up at my fiance, who was filming me for Instagram. <laughs> it was day two of a five-day fast, and those olives nearly broke me. I wondered if the contestants on The Biggest Loser ever had to force themselves to eat olives. I loved that show as a teenager. Finales were my favorite. There was Lexi from Wichita, Kansas, with her 250-pound picture on a huge projector, 30 feet tall. The screen showed clips of her struggling to keep up with her children, and then it jumped to her crying on the floor while Julian Michaels screamed at her for breathing. <laughs> then the shift. Triumphant music played, and Lexi walked out to the live audience, 100 pounds lighter, and everyone cheered. Right there. Lexi achieved it. She had it. I've been chasing my triumphant after moment my whole life. I was craving validation for my existence, and because I grew up in the early 2000s, my body was the source of all my pain. I was disappointed in my body even as early as elementary school. Not like other girls, I thought. They had it all together. Their moms bought them the best jeans from Limited 2. <laughs> and their sparkly shirts didn't cling to their bellies. I like to stretch out the bottom of my shirts so they wouldn't cling. In fifth grade, I enlisted my friend Laura to help me slim down by the end of the school year. Our class was going to the water park to celebrate being done with elementary school, and I was obsessed with my body looking good. I put together a workout plan for myself and showed it to Laura. She pointed at the cool surfer chick I had doodled on it and said, she shouldn't be on the plan. She isn't skinny. My cheeks burned, and Laura noticed. Her sides don't go in, see? She pointed to the part of the girl's body where, anatomically, a human has a, human has a rib cage. She's too wide. I had never considered that your body could be too wide in that direction. Were my curves in the right place? I started running laps during recess. I hated running laps. They were the olives of physical conditioning. <laughs> the weekend before our field trip, my mom and I went to find a bathing suit with Laura and her mom. They were driving us out to the coast to go to the Roxy and Billabong outlet. Blue Crush was my favorite movie at the time. So only Roxy or Billabong would do. I imagined myself jumping into the pool and emerging in a wave of bubbles in my surfer bikini. Kate Bosworth had nothing on my fifth grade swagger. <laughs> I scoured the racks, pulling anything that reminded me of Blue Crush. Anything brightly colored, vaguely Hawaiian, and very little fabric. Laura decided to go against our plan and went for a one piece instead of a bikini. She went to church every Sunday, and she felt God didn't want her in one just yet. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> With my pile of fabric strips, I made my way to the fitting rooms. Fitting rooms are interesting places. Those three panel mirrors highlight every angle. They have fluorescent lights right overhead, so in the mirror, I could see all the shadows my body casted on itself as I tied pieces of lycra to my chest. I couldn't tell if the bottoms were too tight or if they were just fighting with my Powerpuff Girls underwear. <laughs> Sweat started to form on my upper lip as I twisted in and out of different bikinis. Finally, I made my choice. I was stoked. It was royal blue with white Hawaiian-style flowers scattered around it. I called my mom into the room, and she looked at me. She smiled in that knowing, sympathetic way. Honey, I think we should pick something else. 
Heat began to build behind my eyes. I looked at myself in the mirror and I didn't see Kate Bosworth staring back at me. My mom could tell I was trying not to cry. It just might be too soon to get a bathing suit in that style. Let's go look for a different type. I searched her face, hoping she meant I was too young for this style and not because my body didn't look good in it. Was she trying to help me be more comfortable or was she course correcting the chubby 10 year old who found herself thinking she could pull something off she couldn't? But this is all they have, I managed as the tears dripped off my chin. I pulled my clothes back on and walked out of the fitting room, my eyes glued to the floor. Which one did you pick, Laura asked. My mom jumped in. We haven't found one just yet. I don't know what Laura thought, but I couldn't bring myself to look at her. I just walked back over to the racks with my mom. My throat was tight as we weaved in and out of the rows. I felt like every shopper was looking at us and thinking I should probably wear a different style bathing suit. My mom eventually pulled a tankini style suit that was beautiful and God approved. <laughs> it had all the colors of a sunset with shiny gold flecks woven throughout. It was Roxy and it was full price. It was a concession. I don't remember feeling uncomfortable during our class field trip at the water park. I remember waiting in line for water slides and floating along the lazy river. I remember a girl's nipple hanging out of her bikini top and all the boys losing their shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one said anything about my body and I didn't go looking for input. I liked the way the colors of my suit looked underwater. The sun hit the gold flecks and glittered on the pool floor. I liked the way the bubbles felt against my body as I jumped into the deep end and floated to the surface but I was in Cape Bosworth emerging from the water. My bathing suit victory was fleeting. I continued believing I was never enough. I jumped between different workout programs and diet fads that never actually filled the hole left by my lack of self-worth. My mom did her best to support me like that day in the dressing room. She grew up in the 80s where supermodels were invented. So she had her wounds too. I got my taste for multi slim fast shakes from her. She read People's Magazine and I always stole them so I could copy Jessica Simpson's diet plan. <laughs> I watched her count points during her on again, off again relationship with Weight Watchers and cheered her on for those weekly weigh-ins. If I found the right diet or workout or lifestyle, then maybe I could light the path for my mom too. Instagram is my version of People Magazine. Every single change, every wellness tip came from my scrolling. I was looking for that silver bullet post that would fix all my programs with weight. I'm sorry, we'll fix all my problems with weight. Instagram led me to finally ditch hormonal birth control. When I stopped taking the pill, my ovulation didn't return for almost a year. My body was used to operating on a different system, so when it had to rely on its natural programming, it didn't know what to do. I gained 15 pounds, my hormones rioted, and my hair fell out. At a hair appointment, I sat breathless in the stylist chair. I looked at myself in the mirror and my legs began to sweat. My stylist has the unique skill of saying the most brutal thing, and yet you feel grateful for hearing it. <laughs> The first time I met her, she told me my current haircut gave me a rat tail. <laughs> On this visit, I was dreading her honesty. I knew I had lost a lot of hair, but it hadn't yet been confirmed by an expert. She ran her fingers through my hair, shaking them through my scalp and paused for the briefest of seconds. My eyes must have been pleading because she didn't say what we were both thinking. I popped the tension and I told her I'd been dealing with hair loss and she nodded. In true fashion, she was honest. Yeah. <laughs> You've lost a lot of hair. Like it doesn't even feel like your hair anymore. I just sat there nodding. She styled my hair, I paid, and then sat in my car and sobbed. I didn't know if I could handle all of this. 
I was at my breaking point. I was tempted to accept that this was just my life. I could avoid mirrors and give myself permission to wear yoga pants at work, but that didn't feel right either. I knew if I could figure out all these health concerns, the hair loss, the weight, the irregular cycles, I would be happier. Giving up felt like extinguishing the last fire I had in me to live the life I wanted. After making it through the labyrinth of Kaiser's medical care system, <laughs> a doctor diagnosed me with a common yet horrendously underdiagnosed disorder called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yes, cystic sisters, all right. My ovaries were covered with cysts that messed with my hormones. Lovely. As it turned out, being on the pill was basically hiding something I would have really loved to know about earlier. He suggested I go back on the pill. I started to think we were on the same page. <laughs> PCOS is a form of insulin resistance, and a balanced blood sugar could reverse a lot of my symptoms. I asked him what else he recommended other than the pill, and he offered diabetes medication. Not a Zempic the medication Hollywood elites swear they aren't using but are totally using. <laughs> Unhappy with the lack of answers I was getting from my doctor, I did my own research. And no, not the kind of research that leads people to eat horse dewarming paste. <laughs> Real research from women who knew what they were talking about. I wanted something personalized. No more out-of-touch suggestions from a doctor. I wanted a strategy based on my current health metrics that felt good for me. So I signed up for a 10-week functional medicine course with a dietitian who helped me understand how food could serve as medicine. Step one, FedEx my blood and urine to be analyzed. <laughs> Pee in a cup? No problem. Freeze it for 24 hours before shipping? Weird, but doable. <laughs> Collect your own blood. Harder than you think for someone who bleeds monthly. <laughs> I stopped drinking water 24 hours before collecting my blood. I needed to fill up four blueberry-sized circles, so I took a lance, pricked my thumb, and proceeded to squeeze it of its life juice. Praying it landed properly so I didn't waste any of it. Dehydration made my blood thick and I couldn't even fill one circle, let alone four. I had to use every one of my fingertips to get it done. <laughs> As I drove to work that morning, my bandaged fingers looking silly on the steering wheel, I smiled. Oh, there's a spider on here. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Better are you than me. Yeah. Okay. I was doing something good. This was going to work. While the labs processed my samples, I ate only what the dietitian told me to. Here's where the olives came in. For five days, I went through a fast mimicking diet of little more than powdered soups and broths and teas. I put my cells into cleanup mode. My body started getting rid of the old shit to make room for newer, healthier cells. I was eating astronaut food. And I was flooded with motivation. This was different from the juice cleanses and skinny teas I gagged down in college. It was a challenge I wanted to do. But as motivated as I was, it left me tired and sluggish. But then I felt a shift. The shift I was looking for this entire time. I started to feel better. My skin glowed and I felt an energy I never knew I had. At the end of the fast, I turned every meal into fuel. My biggest victory was my mental shift. As I got ready for work, I looked at myself in the mirror and told myself I was powerful. And I believed it. The program's mantra, progress over perfection, became my life raft. Each week, I learned nutritional science and simple ways to break my issues with food. Nothing was fear-based or judgmental. There was no gold star for a perfect day of eating because that wasn't the point. Meal prepping gave me time back in the evenings. My fiance and I had time to sit down at dinner and enjoy each other. I was manifesting a more abundant life. 
I stopped chasing that after moment because I realized it wasn't real. There was no happiness in finding an after. What I needed was to be content with myself now. At the end of last year, I walked into another dressing room. I met my bridesmaids, my aunt, and my mom at a dress shop. In the showroom, I ran my hands along the silky fabrics. My mom giggled as my friend asked the salesperson to pull an alligator skin dress with a huge bow on the ass. <laughs> we headed to the back where a stage stood between mirrors and benches. It put all eyes on me in every angle, and I was game. The dressing room lights enhanced the sparkles stitched into every wedding gown. My ring refracted rainbows along the wall as I shimmied into the gown. When I twirled out on stage in the winning dress, my mom melted and offered to pay for it. <laughs> this time, I didn't hold back my tears. I looked around at the women here to support me, and I looked back at myself in the mirror. The person who sat in her hairstylist chair, petrified of who she was becoming, would have hated this. The fifth grader would have hated it more. But the woman I was now, she glowed. Thank you. Sarah Sharp, ladies and gentlemen, Sarah.